Corinthians, we're in First Corinthians. Please turn your Bibles to uh, chapter 15, verse 29. So yesterday we learned that uh, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Chapter 15 is all about the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and also the resurrection body. Uh, we learned that Jesus is the first fruits, which means the first crop of the harvest. And um, the resurrection was the heart of the gospel. It confirmed the claim that Jesus' death was for our sins. So Paul here in this chapter is presenting the nature of the resurrection, its meaning, and the significance of the resurrection for us as Christians. And um, so verses uh, 1 through 11, we're talking about the theme of the, of the resurrection, and he reminds the Corinthians that it's the central place of his own missionary preaching and also his own experience that he has been resurrected to new life. Uh, verses 12 through 19 go through the negative consequences of um, what happens if there is no resurrection from the dead. So resurrection is a fundamental piece of Christianity. Um, without it, there is really no excuse for the existence of Christianity. We reviewed also the positive consequences of Jesus's resurrection since it happened. Um, and then Paul gave arguments for the reality of the resurrection from a Christian experience. And then he's going to write about the nature of the resurrection body. And he's going to write about the end of the age, the general resurrection. And then he's going to write about the transformation of the body. There's a lot about the body today. Now, this is different than the body that we talked about when I taught last about uh, the spiritual gifts and, and how we are part of Christ's body. This is your actual body that we're talking about today. So we have a message of encouragement today that Christ is with us. Uh, we've been talking about worship in chapters 11 through 14 and appropriate worship, remembering the the role of women in the church, the head coverings, the Lord's Supper, uh, and not getting out of control with that. And then we talked about the spiritual gifts on Monday. And then in the middle of the section in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 had that beautiful poem about love. And it really showed love in action and what it looks like and what God's love is like for us and how we have a kind of a but with the nature of sin, we have a distorted reality sometimes of what love is. And uh, that's God's greatest gift is love. It's one of the fruits of the spirit. And this discussion of the resurrection is going to basically wrap up this letter to the Corinthians. In the beginning, I was speaking about this place. Here's Greece right here. And Corinth is located in this little isthmus, which is uh, basically a connection to a peninsula, a big piece of land. So this isthmus was just a few miles long. And what they did was they had um, rollers that they would lay out and they would actually pull the ships out of the water as they were um, pulling into the port. So they would pull the ships out of the water, place these ships on rollers, and then they would roll them across the peninsula. And all of the people that were involved in sailing these ships would just hang out in Corinth and, Corinth and enjoy, um, enjoy everything, all the entertainment that Corinth had to offer. And so this group of believers, Corinthians, they were really in an area where there was all kinds of immorality and uh, just loose living. So we start in verse 29. Now, uh, Paul giving arguments, he's going to make an argument that the resurrection is real. So he started encountering, um, people who were denying that the resurrection even happened, which was really interesting. So let's just read. If the dead will not be raised, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead? Why do it unless the dead will someday raise again? 
So Paul's making an argument here and some in the church had started to deny the resurrection. And then in verse 12, Paul had written, some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead. Now he's writing to the Corinthian church leaders about matters concerning the church. And so we see that false teaching had crept into the church. If the resurrection is vital to the Christian faith, then how is it that leaders had gotten to a place where some denied the resurrection? I was kind of thinking about this and how important it is to really stick close uh, to Jesus and his word, the influence of society around us and the worldly voices that we hear um, in life in general can easily sway us from our foundation, which is the truth of the gospel. So Paul's saying, if there's no resurrection, why are you baptizing for people who are already dead? Now, this was a practice that isn't mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. It's kind of unclear what this practice was, uh, but it's sort of this concept of like a vicarious baptism. So apparently people were coming and getting baptized in the name of someone who had passed away. So if you had a friend that died and they had not been baptized, you would go and get baptized in the hopes that um, they would then be resurrected. So Paul's not advocating for this practice in this. He's just mentioning, you know, he's just point, he's just affirming the belief in the resurrection. So you're already baptizing people for the dead. If the dead are dead, obviously you would believe in a resurrection. Otherwise you wouldn't be doing that. Um, so verse 30 says, and why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? If the resurrection wasn't real, then he wouldn't put himself at risk. Second Corinthians 11, 25 to 27 describes what he went through in his, in his journeys. Um, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people and the Jews and the Gentiles, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced dangers in cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who I who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long and endured many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and I have not gone without and I have gone without food. I have shivered I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Okay, so he's going through a lot. If what he was If what he was preaching wasn't real, he wouldn't be putting himself through that uh, on a daily basis. Verse 31 and 32. For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Jesus Christ our Lord has done in you. So he calls them brothers and sisters. And I love that. And then he also talks about the pride in what Jesus, our Lord, has done in you. He can see a transformation in them. He's building them up even as he sees them making mistakes and encountering struggles in their walk. So along with all the things that he encounters on all these dangers and perils that Kelly just talked about that uh, Paul encounters on his missionary journeys, he refers to the people of Ephesus as wild beasts, verse 32. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead? And if there's no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. So he calls them wild beasts because he's referring to the human opposition that he faced in Ephesus. After he left Corinth, he did go to Ephesus and was there for three years, which is oh, like twice as long as he was in Corinth. He was in Corinth for a year and a half. So in verse 32,
Um, in verse 32, it says uh, he uses the scriptures to carry his argument further. If there's no resurrection, then this life is all there is. If this is all there is, then enjoy it while it lasts. If you're living that way, enjoying it while it lasts, you'll get relationships with unbelievers that um, can lead you away from Christ or cause your faith to be shaken. Now, verse 40, 33 says, don't be fooled by those who say such things. For bad corrupt company corrupts good character. Now, this is a quote from a Greek poet who died in uh, 292 BC. And uh, his name was Menander. But uh, I just thought about how Paul was really educated and how he knew his audience. Verse 34, think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. So Christians know that there's life beyond the grave. And our life on earth is preparation for eternity. And God cares about your body. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 13 and 14, You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must. Oh, sorry. That's 12. That's okay. 13. That's okay. 13 is you say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though some day God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies and God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Okay. So he talks about the resurrection and he talks about, uh, he's trying to steer people away from sexual immorality. He cares about your body. And then he says, for your shame, I say, and I just really thought about how he really wants them to come to their senses and act right, to not be ignorant of the things of God and to stop competing over spiritual gifts, which is what they were doing. Um, they stop accepting those around them living in sin and being okay with it, to live for spiritual things. And he's encouraging them to understand God's ways that he sent his son because of his great love for them and for you. Uh, and he died and was resurrected from the dead so that all who believed that he did this could have life in him and that we can be in the presence of God and then we can wear Jesus's robe of righteousness and we can stand before God without shame because he took the penalty for our sin so that we could live free. So Paul's point is that if death is the end, then go ahead and live for self. Go ahead and live for the pleasures of this life and you're justified to live and please yourself. So our hope and um, our trusting God and his plan for mankind, as the Bible shows, life beyond the grave. So this truth, this is a truth about the resurrection. This is like one of the basic things of Christianity. So this truth about the resurrection motivates us to look at just our old way of doing things. And we were dead in our sin. And just know that there's a different way that our choices, like when we live our life our way, they lead to sin and despair separated from God. And that when we choose to do things God's way, that it will lead to joy and peace and freedom and eternity with him. So in verses 35 to 49, Paul talks about the nature of the resurrection body. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put into the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. 
one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Okay, so he asked two questions. How are the dead raised, which is in the resurrection, and how does the mortal body come alive? Like, how, basically, how does the mortal body come alive into the resurrection body? And then what would the resurrection body be like? In Job, he speaks of what it would be like, Job. 19, 25, and 26 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So 19, 25, and 26. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. Okay, so he says your body will decay, but you will be in your body and you will see God. <laughs> so how does this work? So Paul uses seeds, right? He uses seeds of a plant as a way to illustrate the mortal body and the resurrected body. So when you sow a seed, it goes in the ground and um, it has a particular form. It has a shape. It has a being. It has its thing. Then it has to die and then it grows. So... Uh, it's planted and it grows and then it has a different form, but it came from that seed and the death of that seed. So our bodies, when dead and buried, will rise in a new form. And each body is unique and has its own form. So we all have different bodies, different shapes and sizes and abilities. And um, you know, that's part of the wonder of God's creation. He gives us a, observable things in our environment to remind us uh, and to see correlations between our moral bodies and our glorified bodies. So like seeds and I was thinking about the metamorphosis of, you know, butterflies or different insects and how they change from one body to another, but they're still in a body. And then he goes on. So it basically it comes from God and it speaks of the glory of God. And then Paul goes on to talk about the sun and the moon and the stars and how they have their own glory. Mm -hmm. So glory means splendor and it means majestic beauty. And so there are also heavens, verse 40, there are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory while the moon and stars each have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. So I was thinking about our bodies <laughs> and how do we see, how do we see our bodies? How do we see ourselves? Um, do you see your body as a shell? Do you see your body as a temporary home or a temple? Yes. I see my body as a butterfly. As a butterfly, mm -hmm. as the temple of the Holy Spirit, a living sacrifice, a place of proper worship. We see our body, um, as something to be disciplined, Paul describes. Verse 42 um, to 49. So talks about what our bodies will be like in heaven. All right. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. So just like the seed, the resurrection of the dead will be the same. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies will, are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. So our resurrected body will be like different type of body than the earthly body we have now. Our present bodies are perishable and uh, they are prone to decay. The resurrected body will be made to live forever. We're still going to be recognizable. We're still going to have our own personalities and our own individualities, uh, but we will be fully transformed. The work of Christ will be done. We will be perf perfected through his work. And we obviously don't know everything that it's going to be like. Uh, but we know that our bodies will be perfect, 
without sickness, disease, decay, degeneration. There won't be any aches or pains, mm -hmm. no cavities. <laughs> and um, our value won't depreciate um, over time like our bodies do now. So the natural human body is suited to life in this world. It helps us live and exist and move in this world. And then our spiritual body will be suited, suited in the life um, in the world to come. So either way, our, we are embodied. So whether we are in earthly life or spiritual, um, after this life, we will have bodies. And yesterday we learned about being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And 2 Corinthians talks about this in chapter 5, 6 through 10. Thank you, Daisy. So we are always com confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at, at home with the Lord. So whenever we are here in this body, or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we all must stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Thank you. Okay. So our bodies were made to please him. So the end of that speaks to verse uh, 34. Uh, back when Paul urged them to come back to their senses. And uh, that's the NIV version, but the NLT says, think carefully and about what is right. As we all will sit before the judgment seat of Christ. So while we are at home in our body, uh, we are away from the Lord. And so now... When we die, our spirit separates from the body and goes to either heaven or hell. And death is not the end of life for Christians. Spiritual bodies are not going to be limited by the laws of nature. Uh, they won't get weak or tired or fail on us. And the transformed body will no longer be subject to sin or death. And so there's more distinctions coming up between earthly bodies and resurrection bodies. Earthly bodies suited to natural life again and resurrected bodies suited to eternal life. Verse 45 and 46 says the scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last man, Adam, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body. Then the spiritual body comes later. OK, so Adam was a living person and Christ is a life giving spirit. It says Adam was the first man. And Christ is referred to as the last Adam. He entered into a new form of existence. He is the source of resurrection life. And that's specifically for people being saved. More, uh, So all people calling on the resurrected Lord to be their savior are now in Christ, which means that we're buried with Christ and then we are resurrected with him. So the Bible also talks about a resurrected life which is new and completely transformed. Um, you can tell who it is, but the transformational work of Jesus is in that person, making them new and turning them into a new creation. Um, and the person actually appears changed. So death from the natural life gives birth to the spiritual life. Verse 47 through 49 says, Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. <clears throat> so Adam and Christ are representatives of the mortal body and the eternal body. <clears throat> so 
Adam's body is, so man's body is perishable and Christ is imperishable. Um, there's just a whole list of things that are, you know, versus one versus the other. So Adam's body exists in dishonor and is corrupted by sin. And um, Jesus's body is then raised in glory. Adam's body exists in weakness and Christ is raised in power of the Holy Spirit. Adam had a natural body and Christ has a spiritual body. And Adam is the image of the man made out of dust. And Christ is the image of the man from heaven. So then later in um, verse 53, it also is the image of a mortal versus a mortal body. <clears throat> we have to give up our bodies to inherit the kingdom of God. But we will inherit uh through the resurrection matthew 25 31 to 34 says um when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, so this speaks of that there will be a resurrection for believers and non-believers um, and that Christ will separate them out. So flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom because flesh and blood wear out and God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. So we need the eternal body in order to live in it. In order to live in God's kingdom, we need our eternal bodies. We also don't know what the kingdom's like, but in the parable of the mustard seed, Jesus describes it and says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? And so Jesus tries to describe and speak uh, to us in parables and Taylor. In Mark 4, verse 30 through 33, he talks about uh, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may, may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Okay, so he describes the kingdom of God as a mustard seed that then grows into something that we can't even imagine when we look at this little tiny mustard seed. So he's explaining that we can't imagine what the kingdom of God is like, but that's what he's, that's what our um, heavenly bodies are going to be prepared for and so he spoke in those parables so that we were able to hear it and you know we have limitations as humans we are limited in what we can understand or fathom and so when we can fathom a mustard seed we could see this much but then what taylor described um in mark is is what it actually is and what will be revealed to us first corinthians 2 9 Says. that is what the scriptures mean when they say no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has imagined what god has prepared for those who love him a sorry man that was great no eye has seen no ear has heard what god has prepared for those who love him okay What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. 
verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. This is a revelation. It's God's plans for our future. This is the hope for a resurrection and it's what gives us confidence as Christians. And he says, we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. Now he says all. Um, he says all. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. So I think about the people that have died already. And then I think about believers and unbelievers. He says all. So some will be living. So it says it will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. And our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. So this tells us that some will be living when the last trumpet is blown, those who are already dead will be raised with their heavenly bodies and those who are living will transform. So Emily went into this a little bit yesterday and we learned something yesterday that when we are absent from the body, we're present from the Lord, but our bodies are here and they won't be raised until the prophecy is fulfilled and Jesus returns. And then at that point, all their bodies will be raised. And then the people who are alive at that point will be transformed into their heavenly bodies. Everyone will receive their heavenly bodies at once. Some will be transformed and some will be raised. Now, all are raised, but some will go to heaven and some will go to hell. And um, so Revelation eleven fifteen says... Um, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there was a loud voice shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his, and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. He will reign oh. forever and ever. Okay. So this is when this ushers in the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. So this is what ushers in the new heaven and the new earth when the last trumpet is blown. Um, 54 through 56 says, then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? sting. <laughs> so Paul's point is that the resurrection overthrows the power of death to corrupt the body and destroy the soul. So that's what sin does. And that's what being here on this earth does. And the resurrection just overthrows the power of it. In Isaiah 25, 7 and 8. Isaiah is Taylor's jam, so she can read it. 25, 7 and 8. And he will destroy on this mountain the, the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So Satan basically tried to make a mockery in the garden when he tempted Eve and sin came in the world. And also he tried to do that again at the cross, but God turned what looked like defeat in both of those um, situations and turned it into a victory by raising Christ from the dead. So since Christ rose in victory, Death is no longer a source of dread or fear for us. Sin leads to death. And when sin entered the world, death entered the world. So Moses received the law from God in the Old Testament to show us that we fall short of it, right? The law demonstrates what we cannot achieve, what we cannot attain to show us that we are less than God um, and that we all fall short of it. But because of the resurrection, we have hope for life beyond the grave 
and beyond sin and beyond the grip of death that sin has on us. For the sin is the sting that results in the death and the law gives sin its power. And verse 57 says, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because of this, everything that we do is worth something for God. Okay. Our lives are not in vain. We have victory because of the resurrection. The same power that rose Jesus from death lives inside of us. And we can be certain that because like, because Christ rose from the dead, that we also have, that we also have victory over death. Romans 8, 11, Tina. I thought he had first Thessalonians 4, 13, 14. Oh, you do. Romans 8, 11. I'll read it. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Oh, I think it was door of hope. I'm sorry. Okay. He will give life. Okay. So, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your moral, mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. That happens as you're living and then it happens um, when you get your glorified body. Okay. Verse 58 says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Amen. So stand firm. Let nothing move you. Stay faithful to the end in your morality, right? And in our service to him. Okay, nothing you, you do for the Lord is ever useless because your reward for walking faithfully is eternity in your reward for walking faithfully with the Lord in this life shows us that we're guaranteed to be with him in eternity. So the enemy will try to convince you that you're doing it all for nothing. And I just want to encourage you guys that Christ is with us and to keep working and let J Jesus have the victory um, and then fight from that place and learn to keep a heavenly perspective when you are going through trials and just you know, the hard stuff in life. And so you can see the trials and suffering in this life actually have purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can live your life through that lens, it's difficult to get into a frame of mind where you can see things from that perspective. And it's a struggle each day when we see so much around us that doesn't make sense or that hurts us or, you know, that encourages us to not follow the Lord. And now, Tina, you can read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. I just wanted to point out the part where she said, not grieve like people who have no hope. Mm -hmm. You know, we experience a lot of grief in our life. We suffer losses. We lose people that we love. We lose things in our life. Everything is perishable and will pass away. And um, this is something that has changed in me um, since I started following the Lord. And, um, I lost my son when he was two years old, um, in an accident and, um, just remembering what that was like. And I wasn't following the Lord at the time, but what that was like and the experience of really learning that his life was over and it was permanent and that he wasn't coming back. And then going through five years of that 
and grieving that. And then coming to the program and learning over time and as the years go by and um, the day of his passing um, passes, it's been like almost six years since he passed away, but I just think about him and each year I get more hopeful and more confident that his body has been resurrected with Christ that he's absent from his body, but that he's presence with the Lord and that we have a reunion waiting in heaven. So I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to encourage you guys that, you know, that just really stood out to me that, you know, we don't grieve like people who have no hope, you know, and that was a very hopeless time for me. But now as the Lord is healing my heart and as I am learning to trust him and walk with him and, um, you know, just like Paul says, you know, I have hope in this resurrection. It's, it's what gives us confidence in our life and in our walk that the death is not the end. And um, so whatever, uh, whatever the body is that we have at the time, we don't know the body that we're going to get. But um, when all the prophecy is fulfilled and that when Jesus returns, um, believers who are righteous in Christ will join with him and receive and we'll be receive our new heavenly bodies suited for eternity and um that's awesome so work enthusiastically for the lord you know that nothing you do for the lord is ever useless and and i just wanted to read um philippians philippians 3 12 through 21 which speaks of this as well and it says, <clears throat> it's about pressing toward the goal and um, just staying faithful throughout this life to get to the next life. Um, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I all have already reached perfection. Okay, we're not perfect. Uh, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe that God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we've already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your life after mine, okay? Follow Jesus and pattern your life after his and learn from, uh, well, Paul's saying pattern your life after mine. We need those people that we can pattern our life after too. And Jesus is the ultimate example. And learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. We will take, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Amen. Amen. That was Philippians 3, 12 to 21. <clears throat> and that is the end of our study today. Thank you, everybody.